This purple sucks. Why is purple the fucking worst? I don't like, I don't know what to do. Oh, Jesus Lord. I really hate this. Like, is this, why does this look like this? Like, <sighs> if I drop one more fucking makeup brush, I swear to God, I just, I don't even know. I don't know where, where to go from here. It's like the more I try and blend, the more it just disappears. Oh, speaking of shit storms, hello, this eyeshadow. A fucking mess. What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if you're into makeup or you're into true crime, there's really no reason that you shouldn't subscribe. But if you're not vibing with me or with the channel, that's fine. Contrary to societal belief, it's actually widely beneficial for us to all honor our unique opinions. And if your opinion is that true crime and makeup shouldn't mix, then feel free to pop down to the description box where I've taken the time to list some other creators and some other resources that have covered today's story in a way that I assume is more catered to your particular taste. And with that said and done, why don't we go ahead and get into today's case. All right, so if you tuned in last week, then you got a little hint of the type of case that we're covering today. It's a case that ends on a much more positive note, at least than what we're used to around here. Don't get me wrong, it's still got a lot of layers to it, most of which are still pretty fucked up, but at least no one actually dies today, which is nice. Today, we're talking about a very interesting set of twins, Sunny and Gina Han. And I actually came across this case because I had Googled and I truly don't remember why, but for some reason, I recently found myself Googling real life evil twin. Yeah, my Google history is, it's something. But anyways, I Googled real life evil twin and one of the first things that came up was the Han twin murder conspiracy. And I was like, perfect. So I got to reading, taking my notes, bing, bang, boom, little of this, little of that, and now here we sit today. About to dissect the fuck out of this mess. Okay, so the Han twins, Gina and Sunny Han, were born on April 30th, 1974 in South Korea to their mother, Bu Jun Kim, and their father, Yan Hyao. But unfortunately, at the time the twins were born, their parents' marriage was already just hanging on by a very frayed thread. They were already unhappy prior to the twins' birth, and if you've had kids, you know that it's an experience that will undoubtedly test the limits of you and your partner's relationship. It is such an amazing, beautiful, wonderful, and life-changing experience, but it's also hard and exhausting and taxing. You're sleep deprived and emotions are often running high. And if you don't have a solid foundation to hold you up through that, it's gonna be rough to say the least. And it was rough for Kim and Hyao, beyond rough. So rough that before the girls had even turned one, Hyao made the decision to separate from Kim in hopes of finding happiness somewhere else. And while Kim had been just as unhappy as her husband, this was a choice that was incredibly difficult for her to come to terms with, largely in part to the difficulties she'd experienced throughout her own childhood, being the child of a broken home. Yes, when Kim was a child, her father abandoned her mother and her five siblings to run off with his young mistress, class act. And this display of complete jackassery left Kim's mother struggling to raise her six children all by herself. Thankfully though, well, okay, so I don't really know if thankfully is the right phrase because what I'm about to talk about is still pretty fucked up, at least in my opinion. Okay, so while Kim's father had dipped out and left his wife and six children to pursue a new life, just because Hyao didn't want to be married anymore, it did not mean that he didn't want to be a father anymore, which in theory, I mean, is how it should be. But rather than make a point to remain in both of his twin daughters' lives, instead, he and Kim decided to each take a twin and go their separate ways. Yeah, they pulled a real life parent trap. Seriously though, is that not just like beyond fucked up? If you don't think it is, one, what's wrong with you? And two, there's actual studies on this ship and spoiler alert, ain't great. Apparently separating twins from even as early as birth can create anxiety and fear in the twins. And ultimately it can have negative implications throughout their entire 
life. Yeah, turns out the odds of them reuniting at summer camp and living happily ever after, not in your favor. Evidently, if you separate twins, turns out it's much more likely that you're gonna fuck them right up. Hence why we find ourselves here today, discussing this very story. Kim and Hyao each took a twin, Kim took Sunny and Hyao took Gina. And for the next few years, the girls had no idea that the other one existed. Yeah, they weren't reunited or reintroduced, however you want to look at it, until they were three years old when Kim petitioned for and was granted sole custody of both girls. Which again, kind of sounds good, but now you've separated these girls, gotten them accustomed to living alone with one parent. They've spent their entire lives with a one-on-one -on -one parenting relationship. And now just out of the blue, Gina is stripped away from her father, the only parent she's ever truly known. She's yoinked away from him, thrust into what feels like a completely new family in the blink of an eye, and is now competing for attention from a parent she doesn't even know. That's gonna be a swing and a miss on trying not to fuck these kids up, guys. Cause now not only are they left with their lives completely flipped upside down, just thrown without warning into a violently opposing family dynamic than they've been used to their whole lives, but now they're also left knowing as they grow up, that at one point, their parents essentially chose their favorite twin. Talk about a self-esteem crusher. I mean, my sister and I joke around about who our parents' favorite is, but obviously we know it's all in good fun. We both know deep down it's me. Kidding, obviously. And I have to assume that most siblings have joked around about being their parents' favorite at one time or another, but to know for a fact that your parents had chosen their favorite child and in doing so, willingly forfeited a relationship with the other, that can't make you feel good. I looked into it and parental favoritism, much like separating twins at birth, can have truly damaging effects on a child's psyche. And we're talking long term. Apparently, parental favoritism can lead to the non-favored child experiencing low self-worth and value. They feel inadequate and rejected and they can feel like they're not even genuinely worthy of love or affection. And all of these effects can bleed over into their adult life, negatively impacting job performance and interpersonal relationships. Cause your parental relationship sets the foundation for what you expect out of future relationships. So even though both twins did go through the same thing, as far as being chosen by one and subsequently separated from the other parent, this all seemed to have a much more devastating effect on Gina than it did on Sunny. And in my opinion, that makes sense because not only did she ultimately end up with the parent that didn't initially choose her, but Sunny, even though it was only by like two minutes, was technically the older sibling. And because of this, there was an additional layer of perceived favoritism given to Sunny from Kim. And naturally, over time, this led Gina to really, really envy Sunny. And over time, this morphed into a very competitive sibling rivalry between the girls. So I think we can all agree that this ain't starting off great. And as if life hadn't thrown these poor girls enough curveballs up to this point, shortly after the whole custody switch up and the girls reuniting under the care of solely their mother, Kim decided to pack up she and the girls' lives and move 6,000 miles across the world to emigrate from South Korea to live in the United States. Orange County, California, to be exact. Unfortunately though, this move did not serve as the fresh start or step in the right direction that I have to assume Kim thought that it would. Rather, she really struggled to support her daughters. She struggled to hold on to a job. She struggled to hold on to numerous romantic relationships. And seemingly most detrimental, she struggled with a very serious gambling addiction. Kim would spend her days at the casino, often completely neglecting her role as a mother to Sonny and Gina. And then sadly, on the rare occasions that Kim actually was home with the girls, things were volatile, unpredictable, and often just downright abusive. 
life. And more often than not, Gina felt as though she bore the brunt of Kim's anger. We've already established that Sunny was obviously Kim's favorite. So of course, when she comes home furious that her boyfriend dumped her or enraged that she'd lost a bunch of money at the casino that day, who's she gonna take it out on? Certainly not her golden child, thus resulting in things being significantly more tumultuous between Kim and Gina than things were between Kim and Sunny. However, with their home life being so incredibly unstable, Sunny and Gina really seemed to do their best to put aside their growing rivalry. Out of pure necessity, they latched onto one another in an effort to kind of band together against the chaos they seem to be entangled in. As Kim's gambling addiction worsened and her mental health continued to deteriorate, Sunny and Gina actually bounced around and in and out of a couple different group homes until in 1990, they were sent to live indefinitely with their aunt and uncle in Campo, California. And not surprisingly, once the girls were somewhere that was actually stable, they flourished quickly. They were beautiful, they were smart, their peers really seemed drawn to them. I mean, you would think this would be a turning point in the story, which to be fair, I guess it is, but I have a feeling it ain't gonna be turning in the direction you'd like to think. Nope, because now that the girls' basic needs were being met, they didn't have to get along just to survive anymore. It was no longer necessary for them to put their sibling rivalry aside and support one another. And y'all, their rivalry and competition with one another came back with a vengeance. All of a sudden, they found themselves competing once again for everything. They competed over grades, boys, friends, you name it, each girl was desperate to outdo the other. Sure, they mostly got along in public, but <laughs> behind closed doors, ooh, girl, shit got ugly. And we're not talking your average sibling bickering, <laughs> no, no, no. We're talking fights that went so far off the rails that one time Sunny stabbed Gina in the thigh just to prove a point. Yeah, and they were only 15 when this happened, so they were really wiling out. Despite being identical twins, the girls even did their best to individualize their look because it aggravated them when people would mistake them for each other. Gina, who was usually described as more serious and reserved, wore her hair short with bangs, while Sunny, who was always thought to be more bubbly and outgoing, kept her hair long and forewent the Fringe. The pair graduated from Mountain Empire High School in the early to mid 90s. I couldn't find an exact year. But the main takeaway is that the girls had done so exceptionally well throughout their high school career that they were actually named co-valedictorians for their graduating class. They were just so smart and so capable and they truly had so much potential. They could have done anything they wanted to. But considering the fact that I'm sitting here and talking to you about them, we know that this story is not headed down a very righteous path. Following their high school graduation for the first time since, I guess, before they were reunited, the girls kind of got to do their own thing. Sunny accepted a full ride scholarship to the University of Laverne and Gina, not keen on the idea of a four year university, instead took a job working as a waitress in order to begin supporting herself. She continued on like this for a few years until she completed all the necessary requirements and was granted official US citizenship. She then took her proud new title of American straight down to the nearest United States Air Force recruitment office and enlisted. And before she knew it, she was in Texas at the Lackland Air Force Base, already a month into her basic training and she, hated it. Every day she woke up just filled with regret that she had made this commitment and she desperately tried to think of a way that she could get out of it. Even all this way away from her, Gina was still consumed with envy, knowing that Sunny was back in California, she was living it up in college, and she was working towards her dreams. All while she was stuck here in Texas at a job she hated. And due to the stringent enlistment contract you sign when you join the US military, homegirl felt stuck. There was seemingly no way out of this, in her opinion, miserable situation that she'd gotten herself wrapped up into. That is until she realized that there might be one loophole that she could exploit as a way to break her contract and abandon her commitment. And that 
was a little policy issued under Department of Defense Directive 1304.26 on December 21st, 1993. You may have heard of it. It was instituted by the Clinton administration. Last chance, lock in your guesses. We're talking about the oh so discriminatory don't ask, don't tell ban, which prevented service members from being openly gay, bisexual, or otherwise without the threat of being discharged. Now, while one may ignorantly argue that, oh well, it didn't ban LGBTQIA plus individuals from being in the military, just from making their sexuality known. Well, to that I say, for 17 years, this law brazenly sent the message that discrimination was acceptable and that unless you were a heterosexual cisgender individual, you need to conceal your true self. Not to mention that it ended up costing thousands of brave service members who were willing, ready, and capable and wanting to serve their country the opportunity to do so simply because of who they loved. So no, it was not okay, but I digress. Regardless of my personal opinion on the matter, Don't Ask, Don't Tell came in clutch for Gina. She figured that she could just come out to her commanding officers and that once they knew she was gay, they would have no choice but to relieve her of her obligation to serve. Easy peasy, except for the fact that it wasn't. She was met with an enormous level of blowback from the Air Force to the point where she was worried she was going to be arrested for I don't know, deceiving her country. But luckily for Gina, once the initial wave of fallout passed, she was let go from her position in the Air Force with no lasting consequences. And all the while, it appeared that things for Sunny just couldn't have been any better. She was crushing it in college, driving around in an expensive car, constantly dressed to the nines, hair done, nails done, everything did. She had a boyfriend. She had an awesome group of close friends surrounding her. The girl's lives could not have been on further opposing sides of the spectrum. And even though they rarely spoke, save for a few phone conversations here and there, it was just enough to erode away whatever minuscule fragment of self-esteem that Gina had left. Despite her hopes, getting out of the Air Force had not solved all of her problems. Rather, it seemed like it was the impetus to her subsequent downfall. Following the end of her military career, Gina made her way back to California, where she ended up taking a job as a blackjack dealer at the Barona Resort and Casino in Lakeside. And given that some people may have a genetic predisposition to addiction, I think you can see where this is headed. Just as her mother had all those years ago, Gina too developed a very destructive gambling habit. It started with gambling away her tips at the end of her shifts, which then escalated into gambling away hundreds of dollars at a time until eventually Gina drained her life savings. I think somewhere around like three or $4,000. Like that, she lost it all. But if we know anything about addiction, it's that it certainly doesn't stop when the money runs out. Nope, instead that's usually when out of desperation, the person who's struggling begins to do things that they would likely never do otherwise. Like, I don't know, maybe stealing from friends and family, which <laughs> just so happens to be exactly what Gina did. In fact, by 1996, she had stolen upwards of $50,000 by either writing fraudulent checks or by stealing credit cards. Much like anyone in the thick of addiction, Gina was in over her head before she even knew what she was doing. She was up to her eyeballs in debt and she had no way to pay it back. And to make matters worse, people were starting to get hip to her thievery, specifically her uncle. Yes, the very same uncle that she and Sunny lived with throughout high school. Yeah, Gina had taken him for 10 grand and he found out about it and he was not happy. So fearing the consequences of her actions and knowing that she certainly couldn't pay back the people she had stolen from. That coupled with her practically non-existent self-esteem, Gina actually ended up trying to take her own life by taking a ton of sleeping pills and washing it down with alcohol. Thankfully, her attempt on her own life didn't go as she'd planned and ultimately she did survive. However, almost immediately after she bounced back from this, she was arrested at a friend's house for the theft she committed against her uncle. She ultimately served 10 days in jail for this before she was released on three years probation. Oh, and she was also ordered to pay restitution to all of her friends and family that she'd victimized. So, you know, the whole rock bottom has a basement thing? Yeah, that's about where Gina found herself at this point in her life. There's rock bottom, 50 feet of crap, 
than me. She had no job, no money, nowhere to live. She alienated damn near everyone she'd ever known. I mean, she truly had nowhere to turn. So with no other real options available to her, Gina swallowed her pride and she reached out to, I'd assume, one of the only people she felt she had left, her twin sister, Sunny. After a brief recap of the absolute shit storm that Gina had been through, Sunny actually graciously invited her to come and stay with her in her Orange County apartment. And this sounds like super nice of Sunny, right? I mean, she's thriving in adulthood. So it was incredibly kind and generous of her to invite her vulnerable sister to come and live it up with her. Yeah? Well, if we've learned anything throughout our time together, it's that if you're being featured on my channel and your life looks perfect from the outside looking in, the reality likely is that shit is a mess. And that's precisely what Sunny was actually dealing with. Basically, from the moment Sunny stepped foot onto her university campus, she felt as though she was beneath her fellow classmates. Laverne's student body was made up of primarily wealthy kids from Los Angeles. And because Sunny was there on a scholarship and she wasn't born with a silver spoon in her mouth, she felt immense pressure to feign the same level of wealth that her peers seemed to come from. She was desperate to fit in, to look and to act exactly like her fellow classmates. She actually ended up putting more time and effort into looking and acting the part than she did into her academics, causing her grades to suffer significantly until she actually lost her scholarship and was forced to leave the university. She did try and pick her studies back up at the local community college. However, she just could not seem to get her academics back on track, no matter how hard she tried. And ultimately she ended up dropping out of her community college courses as well before she finally settled into a job as a receptionist to support herself. So yeah, contrary to popular belief, Sunny was not living the dream life she had appeared to be living. And this really, shocked Gina when she got to her sisters and they caught up on everything that had been going on over the preceding years. She couldn't believe what she was hearing from Sunny. And funnily enough, initially, the twins seemed to forge a new bond over their shared struggles, much like they had when they were in the throes of growing up in their mother's home. Sadly though, old habits die hard. Once the novelty of their new living arrangement wore off, the twins seemed to fall right back into their old cycle of toxic competition and violent arguments. They actually fought so violently and so viciously that at one point, their altercation had to be broken up via police interference. Now, I don't think that either girl would claim they were innocent in that particular situation. So it was quite shocking to Gina when that visit from police ended with Sunny in cuffs and being hauled off to jail. And this arrest actually had nothing to do with this fight. Rather, Sunny was headed to the big house to face consequences of her own credit card fraud. Yep, the once deemed golden child back while trying to play rich in college, had racked up close to $1,500 in fraudulent credit card purchases. And then, talk about delusional, Sunny was pissed at Gina for this. She thought it was Gina's fault that she'd been arrested because it was her fight with Gina that had gotten the cops called and that was what ultimately resulted in her being arrested. She even called Gina from jail and screamed at her, telling her that as soon as she got home, she was going to kick her out. Now, obviously it was not Gina's fault that Sunny got arrested. Sunny got arrested because of Sunny's actions. Just because she'd managed to evade the warrant up to that point did not shift the blame, sorry. But that said, Gina, wasn't an angel in all this either. She was pissed that her sister would have the audacity to kick her out, knowing damn well she had nowhere else to go. So in all her anger towards Sunny, for Sunny's misplaced anger towards her, Gina decided to get revenge by stealing Sunny's ID, credit cards, and car, and going on a shopping spree. Are we, are we kidding with this? Nope, she sure was not. And not only did she steal from her sister, but she also drove Sunny's car to San Diego, to her ex-boyfriend's house, where she proceeded to steal a bunch of checks. What did Einstein say? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Bitch, this is insanity. How are you about to be on probation for theft and then just go out and commit a bunch more theft? I'm, I'm getting a headache. You know what? Actually, I'm going to take my break, throw on my lashes, 
Take a fucking Excedrin. And when we come back, the consequences of Gina's actions. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so we're back. Gina's on probation, still making questionable decisions. And because of this, she ends up getting arrested again. However, this time, because she was already on probation, her punishment was slightly more severe. Emphasis on slightly. Because while she was technically sentenced to six months in jail this time, that time also came with a five hour a day work furlough. So five days a week for five hours a day, Gina was able to walk out the prison doors and just go to work like a regular old average Joe. And I feel like had she wanted to, Gina really could have used this time and used this work for a low privilege to her benefit. She's gaining work experience that ideally she could put towards a job once her sentence was over. And when she was locked up, she could have used that time for some introspection, you know, self-reflection. If she had wanted to be rehabilitated, she really could have come out the other side with hopefully a better outlook on life and the motivation to make something of herself. But again, here we sit. So <laughs> we know that ain't what's gonna happen. Nope. Instead, one day while out on her work furlough, Gina decided that she'd had enough of jail. She decided that when the time came for her to clock out of work and head back to her cell, uh, she just wouldn't. Yep. Our girl went on the lam. However, she did not do this with the goal of running off and finding happiness and starting a new life somewhere. Rather, she was in the wind with the sole intention of exacting revenge on Sunny. Now, obviously she couldn't go back to Sunny's apartment. One, that probably would have been the first place that police went to look for her when she didn't show back up at jail that evening. And two, um, What's she gonna do? Show up and be like, hey girl, here to fuck up your world. No, she had to find somewhere to go that she could lay low for a while and orchestrate a plan to make her sister pay. Pay for what? I don't really know, but in her head, everything bad in her life was somehow her sister's fault. So that, I guess. Luckily for Gina, two friends of hers, two sisters that weren't a complete toxic nightmare, Nikki and Rita, they agreed to take her in and let her ride out her time as a fugitive under their roof. And even though she was on the run trying to evade Johnny Law, Gina still managed to have some fun. She still managed to make some new friends. There were a couple of people in particular that were in and out of Nikki and Rita's place that Gina seemed to get along with really well. But the most important one to our story today is 16 year old Archie Bryant. Archie was a local kid who primarily hung out at Nikki and Rita's as sort of a hideaway from his less than ideal home life. While Archie was quiet and sweet, he'd grown up around drugs and drug addicts. There was a massive crack cocaine issue that swept through San Diego in the 80s. And unfortunately, Archie's family sadly fell victim to said epidemic. But even with these obstacles at home, Archie still managed to stay in school and in extracurricular activities. He had a rough life and, you know, he found himself in more than a few scuffles in his 16 years, but overall he really did want to do well for himself. He wanted to make it out of his family's toxic cycle and off into the world to eventually make something of his life. And this was the point that Archie was at in life when purely by happenstance, Gina Han waltzed into the picture. For explicit clarification, to my knowledge, there was never anything romantic about the friendship between Archie and Gina. Now that's not to say that their friendship wasn't wildly inappropriate as you'll soon see, but I do think it's important to note that again, as far as I'm aware, their friendship never crossed any sort of statutory lines if you catch my drift. Archie always maintained that he was never romantically attracted to Gina. He also said, hilariously, might I add, that she just seemed a little crazy. So while he wasn't physically attracted to her, he was, I guess, drawn to the sort of danger she emitted. Not to mention that they did have a lot in common. They both had rough upbringings. They were both children of addicts. They had a lot to empathize with one another over, which really helped to foster a pretty quick bond between the two of them. And whether they'd initially expected it or not, Gina and Archie, soon became each other's confidants. Like I said, they talked about their childhood, they talked about their days, they shared stories, good and bad. Shoot, Archie was even comfortable enough with Gina to show her a spot on his foot 
where he'd accidentally shot himself. And while you may hear that and likely think, oh my God, this 16 year old boy has access to guns. Gina heard this and she thought, oh my God, this 16 year old boy has access to guns. They always say inflection really matters. Now, obviously a gun was something that Gina herself did not have the ability to access. Because remember, not only is she a convicted felon anyway, but she's also a literal fugitive at this point after skipping out on her prison sentence. So upon hearing that Archie had access to guns, well, that got Gina's wheels turning. Her mind started racing and all of a sudden, she realized that if Archie could get her a gun, maybe she could finally get that sweet revenge on her sister that she'd been waiting for. Maybe once and for all, she could have the last laugh. And for the low, low price of $60, Archie was able to procure a two-shot Derringer, which is the most hilariously ridiculous looking gun I have ever seen. But that's not the point. Once Gina had this gun in her possession, it didn't take long for her to seize an opportunity to put her very messy plan into action. Everything seemed to fall in place for her one day when Archie and his best friend, Jonathan Syrath, asked Gina for a ride to school. I guess they were running late. I don't know if they missed their bus. I don't know if they overslept. All I know is that for whatever reason, they were running late and they needed a ride, which Gina happily agreed to give them. So Archie hopped in the front seat and Jonathan, who went by Yoshi, hopped in the back. And unfortunately, completely unbeknownst to them, they had just made a huge mistake that would ultimately haunt them for years to come. You see, what Gina had actually intended for that day was to finally carry out her completely ludicrous plan. Her plan to murder her twin sister and assume her identity. Of course, she didn't tell the boys that right away. You can't spring that kind of thing on people. You, you don't wanna spook them. You gotta ease people in to contract killing, obviously. So in order to do just that, Gina suggested that instead of her taking them to school like she'd initially agreed to, that day they should just skip school and accompany her on an hour long drive to Irvine to pick up some things she'd left at her sister's apartment. She even offered each of them $100 cash money if they would come with her and help her move said stuff. They seemed a little hesitant at first, but once Gina offered them the money, they both agreed to go with her just as she hoped they would. Then once they got on their way, Gina started casually talking about these Asian gangsters she'd supposedly had a run in with back when she lived with Sunny. She even told the boys that she'd been jumped by a group of them very shortly before she'd come to stay with Rita and Nikki. She told them that because of this, she was actually worried about what might happen if she ran into any of them like hanging around outside Sunny's apartment. And hearing about all of this actually really upset Archie because appropriate relationship dynamic or not, he'd come to really care for Gina over the course of their friendship. So hearing that this awful thing had happened to her and hearing that she still held so much fear regarding these gangsters, well, Archie started to feel like it was his duty almost to protect his friend. Um, sidebar, if you're about to go scrubbing back through this video to try and find where you missed the whole Asian gangster story, don't bother, you didn't. There were no Asian gangsters, Gina hadn't been jumped. This was just a ruse she was presenting to the boys to, I don't know, I guess get them feeling all pumped up and hostile prior to arriving to Sunny's. And it definitely worked. Their adrenaline was definitely pumping, which Sunny fed into by asking them about all the fights they'd ever been in. And more specifically, she asked them if they'd ever quote, knocked someone out before. So clearly she had some preconceived notions about these boys and she was really trying to perfectly tailor her plan to capitalize on exactly what she thought the boys were capable of pulling off. This is all just so inappropriate and so manipulative. It's such an abuse of power. It is just shameful. The fact that this adult woman is roping these innocent kids into this stupid plot that could undoubtedly ruin the rest of their lives. So selfish. Anyways, once she felt that she had the boys on board with the possibility of a physical altercation, the possibility of violence, she moved on to the next phase of her plan, which was acquiring the supplies she thought she needed to get the job done. Once in Irvine, the trio stopped at a grocery store where Gina filled her basket with duct tape, twine, gloves, and 
a potato. <laughs> and when the boys asked her about this incredibly odd assortment of items, Gina just explained to them that these were the things she needed to have on her in the event that they did run into that Asian gang. Which, personally, I've got some questions, but evidently Archie and Yoshi did not because when she explained that to them, they were just like, yeah, okay. But to be fair, it's not like you can really blame them for believing her. They were 16. Their brains weren't even fully developed yet. A lot of times when you're a kid and an adult tells you something, you just believe it. I mean, how many of y'all learned way later in life than you'd care to admit that if you turned the interior light of a car on while driving at night, you in fact were not committing a class A felony? Because I know my mom had me convinced one time when we were driving to Florida that if I dared turn on the interior light, there would be SWAT teams and one of those Hannibal Lecter transport rigs waiting for me the second my little second grade sneakers touched down on that Disney World pavement. And then I just blindly believed it for years. Never questioned it, never gave it a single skeptical thought, just took her word for it. All this to say, please reserve your judgment on Archie and Yoshi and remember that while they certainly are not innocent in this story, they were fully and purposefully manipulated by a grown woman who preyed on their vulnerabilities and their teenage ignorance. Following their shopping trip, next our trio made their way to the San Joaquin Marsh. And while there, they attached the potato to the gun <laughs> and they played target practice. I'm sorry, I'm laughing because the image I have in my head is just so incredibly ridiculous. I mean, the gun already looks like it came out of a fucking cartoon and then you're gonna cram a potato on the front of it? Absurd. I guess the potato was meant to serve as a silencer of sorts, which they determined did work after they fired the gun at the marsh. That said, remember this gun only held two bullets. So I don't think they were at the marsh for too terribly long. And once they did pack up and leave, that is when they finally made their way to the San Marco apartments where Sunny lived. They pulled up, they parked, and they simply waited. They waited until they saw someone making their way towards leaving the building, which is when Gina ran up and caught the door. I guess the building had like a security door at the front to keep people who didn't have any reason to be there out. You know, like people trying to kill their sister. But sneaky, sneaky Gina, she managed to make her way into the building and straight to the leasing office where she impersonated her sister and tried to get the manager to provide her an extra key to Sunny's apartment. And I'm not exactly sure why, because Sunny and Gina are identical twins, but for whatever reason, the office manager refused Gina the key, forcing the trio to come up with a new plan of entry for the apartment. Mind you, these boys still think that they're just there to help Gina pick up and move a few things that she'd left there when she lived there. So when she told them that they'd need to go in for her and that they should take the gun with them, they were both just kind of like, what? Which is understandable. The fuck I need a gun for to go in and grab some clothes, some books, and like a coffee mug. The boys were not having it. Archie in particular was vehemently against involving the gun. And sensing that she was losing control over the situation, Gina first reminded the boys that she was intending to pay them for their help. And then she just came out and flat out asked Archie if he had ever killed anyone before. Clearly confused by her line of questioning, Gina then went on to ask him if he would do what she'd been planning on him doing all along. She looked him square in the eyes, no holds barred, and asked him, if he would kill her sister. Seriously, how brazenly she approached this, how just nonchalantly she dropped this bombshell onto two 16 year old boys is just unbelievable. Shockingly, both boys declined the job offer of contract killer, which subsequently caused Gina to fly off the handle. She started yelling and berating the boys all while she furiously beat on the dashboard and the steering wheel. And this really freaked Archie out because he'd never seen his friend behave like this before. Not to mention that he just clearly pissed off a woman who was more than willing to orchestrate the death of her own sister. So if he didn't do what she wanted him to do, would that mean that his life could possibly hang in the balance as well? Well, that was a risk that Archie simply was not willing to take. So purely out of self-preservation, Archie took the gun from Gina, almost as if to say, fine, you crazy bitch, I'll do it. And when she saw this, it was like a switch flipped in Gina. She went from yelling and throwing a tantrum to laughing and clapping like an actual lunatic. Honestly, the mental image of that, 
gives me the willies. Little did Gina know though that Archie had absolutely no intentions of actually following through on this commitment. Rather, his goal was to placate Gina by going in and scaring Sonny, getting Gina's stuff, and then getting the hell out of Dodge. He hoped that once she had her stuff back, she'd get over the whole, you know, murder thing, and that everything would kind of just inevitably blow over. So in order to get into the apartment and execute his version of the plan, Archie and Yoshi agreed at Gina's behest to pose as magazine salesmen. Gina drove he and Yoshi to the store. They picked out some magazines, mainly like Vogue or Cosmopolitan, things that were supposed to be marketed towards women. Then they headed back to the apartment building. And once they were there, Gina reiterated to the boys exactly how she wanted things to play out. She wanted them to barge into the apartment, threaten Sunny with the gun prior to tying her up with the twine and duct taping her mouth so that she couldn't get away or scream. The boys agreed and with their magazines in hand, they headed into the building full of adrenaline and full of anxiety. They made their way to Sunny's apartment, knocked on the door and they were met in response by Sunny's 19 year old roommate, Helen Kim. While the boys tried to I guess kind of like case the inside of the apartment and determine their best course of action. They asked Helen if she wanted to buy some magazines, which she declined. And then before they could really even get a lay of the land or even determine if Helen was Sunny or if Sunny was even there, Helen just closed the door, leaving the boys confused as to what their next move should be. So Archie ran back to the car and he explained to Gina what had happened. And this visibly annoyed her. She demanded that he go back up to the apartment and start the whole thing over. So he did as he was told. He headed back up to the apartment. He knocked on the door again. However, this time, no one answered. Wah, wah, wah. So frustrated, our trio took a break from their plan. They went to get some lunch before returning yet again to the apartment complex to yet again attempt their harebrained scheme. And would just blows my mind is that at no point was Gina like, hey, y'all think this is a bad idea? It's not like she acted quickly or on impulse. This was a damn near all day endeavor. And never once did she think maybe she should just turn around and abort this mission. Like that is just crazy to me. This is what, like the fourth attempt? What a mess. But I guess you know what they say, if at first you don't succeed, this is something. Thank you, I'll be here all night. And that is exactly what Yoshi and Archie did. They headed back up to Sunny's apartment. They knocked on the door. Helen answered again. However, this time before she could shut the door, Archie and Yoshi forced their way inside. Before poor Helen could even process what was going on, these two, to her knowledge, magazine salesmen were in her home and one of them, Archie, was pointing a gun to her head. Obviously this was incomprehensibly terrifying for Helen. One minute she's turning down a Cosmo subscription and the next minute she's being held at gunpoint and screamed at. I mean, that's a bad day for anybody. Also terrified by everything that was happening, Archie ordered Helen to shut up, sit down on the ground. And he told her that as long as she quote, shut the fuck up, she'd be all right. He then repeatedly began demanding to know where her roommate was. However, Helen was too hysterical to answer his questions because Yoshi was busy trying to duct tape her hands and mouth. Once he was done, Archie instructed Yoshi to keep an eye on Helen while he searched the apartment for Sunny, who thankfully had like just been stepping out of the shower when Archie and Yoshi busted in and started yelling. So before they'd gotten a chance to start searching the place, she'd actually managed to call 911 and report what was happening. I'm not sure exactly exactly how much Sunny was able to convey over her 911 call prior to Archie discovering her. But I do know that she did get connected to an operator and I know that she was able to get across at least the gist. But before she could go into too much detail, Archie burst in the bathroom, put the gun to Sunny's head and demanded to know if she'd been on the phone with police. Obviously Sunny lied and said no, which seemed to put Archie slightly at ease, but he still proceeded to bind and gag her, but he took his duct tape usage way further than Yoshi had. He basically fully encased Sunny's head in duct tape, only leaving her nose free so that she could still breathe. Later, the boys went on to explain that everything they were doing was just things they'd seen bad guys do in movies. And that although it looked like they had a handle on the situation, they did not. And deep down, they were every bit as scared as Sunny and Helen. Once the boys had both women bound, they placed them in the bathtub where they sat just rocking back and forth and crying. Meanwhile, Archie began rifling through the apartment while Yoshi ran out to touch base with Gina. But he was 
not expecting though, was to bust out the door to a sea of flashing lights. Yes, just as Yoshi walked out of the apartment building, police showed up in response to Sunny's 911 call. Yoshi immediately composed himself so as to not draw undue attention his way and he then sauntered over to and back into Gina's car. Confused and scared, Gina actually had the audacity to flag down one of the cops who, once she had his attention, she gave Sonny's name as her own and asked him what was going on. I mean, you gotta have some brass ones to pull some shit like that. Meanwhile, Archie, who heard police approaching, began frantically untying Sonny and Helen and trying to convince them that this whole thing had just been one big, practical joke. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Please don't tell the cops it was me. But big fat bummer for him, as soon as he ran out of the apartment door, Archie was met by police, all with their guns drawn. They immediately instructed him to freeze, but as always, Archie had his own plan and his plan included running, which he did. He turned around and he ran right back through the apartment building and towards the back exit, but not before he ditched the gun. Once he was no longer armed, he ran out the door, but much to his surprise, he was tackled straight to the ground by one of the officers. And while all this is going on, Gina and uh, her brass low hangers, she had Yoshi wait in the car while she got out and headed straight for Sonny's apartment. I'm not sure exactly what her play was here, but as soon as officers saw her, they told her that it wasn't safe and that she needed to leave the premises immediately, which she did. However, she did not manage to walk away before she caught a glimpse of Sonny coming out of the apartment, still trying to remove duct tape from her face and head. And I think that was the exact moment that Gina finally realized for the first time not only what she had just put her sister through, but also what she almost put her through. She claims this is when the guilt of what she'd done initially started to set in, but it certainly did not set in enough for her to do the right thing and turn herself in. Rather, she hopped back in the car, still with Yoshi in the back seat, and she tried to hightail it the fuck out of Dodge, heading straight for the Mexican border. She used Sunny's ID to withdraw $5,000 before she then headed to a Nissan dealer and filled out an application, also as Sunny, to lease a 300ZX sports car. And if you've ever purchased a car, you know that that's not a quick process. So while waiting for the application to go through, Gina and Yoshi went to return the blue Mustang they'd been driving around in all day to the rental agency Gina had gotten it from. Yeah, I don't think that I actually mentioned that, sorry. The car they'd been driving around in all day had been a rental, but Flat twist, when she and Yoshi pulled into the parking lot of the rental agency, officers from the San Diego Police Department were already there waiting for them. Gina tried to play innocent, she tried to play dumb, she even tried to play Sunny again, but as soon as they found a bullet casing matching the weapon used in the false imprisonment that day, well, the story kind of unraveled from there. Not to mention that Archie had already been speaking to police and had already confirmed to them who Gina was and that she had taken he and Yoshi to the apartment that day to kill her sister. Sunny was absolutely gobsmacked to learn that her sister was actually the mastermind behind what had happened to her that day. She didn't even know Gina was out of prison. So to hear not only that she'd escaped her incarceration, but also that she would tried to have her killed, she was definitely more than a little taken back. Gina was ultimately tried for a conspiracy to commit murder, burglary, possession of a firearm, and false imprisonment. She was found guilty in early 1998, and on May 8th, 1998, she was sentenced to 26 years in prison. Now, you may be surprised to learn that Gina actually had a lot of support during her trial, mainly from the local Korean American community. They were horrified by Gina's sentence, and they actually wrote letters begging for more leniency, stating that fighting with siblings was just part of Korean culture. And while I cannot speak on Korean culture because I am American, I can say that in America, it's also common to fight with your siblings. However, it is not common to hire teen boys to have them killed. I mean, my sister and I spent 18 years at each other's throats about everything. But even in the thick of our worst fights, Never in my wildest dreams would I have actually wanted anything bad to happen to her. Then, you know, one day out of nowhere, I realized like, this Brad's all right. And now we're incredibly codependent best friends. So anyways, 
way off topic. Um, the girl's mom also shockingly came out of the woodwork in support of Gina, writing a letter to the judge stating that she bears the responsibility for her daughter's actions because she abandoned them at such a young age. Verbatim, her letter reads, I believe that Gina would not have committed such a crime had I done my duty in raising her as a responsible young adult. Had I been able to raise my two girls in a more stable family environment, things would not have gone this far out of control. And I was actually really surprised by this because she'd spent the girl's entire life fawning over Sunny and making Gina feel inferior. So the fact that she would only show Gina support after she tried to orchestrate to have Sunny killed, I mean, I don't know about you, but I didn't see it coming, personally. Following the announcement of her guilty verdict, Gina began stashing away acetaminophen that she procured from the inmate store. I know it's called commissary, but I feel like I hear prison YouTubers and TikTokers call it the store, so just trying to talk the talk. Thankfully, Gina was discovered prior to the effects of the medication becoming fatal, and she was rushed to a medical center in Anaheim, California for medical attention. And what's really crazy is that throughout this whole shitstorm, Sunny actually tried to take her own life as well. Yeah, once the dust had settled and the initial shock of what had happened wore off, Sunny tried to retract anything and everything incriminating she told authorities about her sister. And when that didn't work on the day that she was scheduled to testify against Gina, she downed 35 sleeping pills. And although she was rushed to the hospital and was resuscitated, Sunny never seemed to get her life back on track. But Put a pin in that because we're going to come back to it. Now, for a while following the case, Sunny and Gina's story became a media sensation. I mean, we've seen it and heard it countless times in movies, books, and in TV shows. But the concept of a real life evil twin, bitch, America was captivated. But just like anything that causes a media sensation, eventually every aspect of the case had been dissected and discussed ad nauseum. And almost just as quickly as the twins were thrust into the spotlight, they faded back to obscurity. During her incarceration, Gina worked towards and obtained a degree in social and behavioral sciences from Feather River College. And even though it took a while, she did finally own up to her involvement in the plot on her sister's life, stating, quote, at one point, absolutely, I wanted to kill my sister. I hated her. I felt badly betrayed by her. And with my growing rage, I wanted my sister dead. But when she was far enough removed and isolated from their toxic relationship, you know, with time to reflect, Gina seemed to develop genuine remorse for what she'd done to her sister and what she had put her through, stating, quote, I felt a lot of guilt and shame for my sister's life because I know she's been struggling. Not being able to be there for her and the trauma of my actions my sister had to endure, I know it was hard for her. I feel very, very, very guilty and shameful for what I've done. As alluded to, Sunny had an incredibly difficult time returning to any normal semblance of life following all this. She struggled with her mental health. She struggled to hold down a job. She ultimately ended up feeling forced into sex work to support herself. She had multiple run-ins with the law since her sister's arrest. And to the best of my knowledge, she remains estranged from Gina and the rest of her family to this day. Gina was actually granted parole in either late 2017 or early 2018. And during her consideration for parole, Sunny was actually contacted and asked her opinion on Gina's possibility at being released. And she actually wrote a letter supporting Gina's parole. She wrote that she believed her sister had served enough time and that she had certainly matured enough to be released. She also added at the end though, that it would be beneficial for Gina to be paroled so that she could take care of their mother. Evidently during Gina's incarceration, Kim had developed diabetes and had also apparently never outgrown her gambling addiction, which kind of makes me wonder if this was like low key, Sunny trying to get the last word, you know, like mom sucks, you take her. I don't know, just a thought. But Gina was released and she did go on to care for her mother. All while obtaining an engineering degree and securing herself her first real steady job ever somewhere in the San Francisco Bay Area. So she's doing well. She has officially superseded Sunny as the favorite child. And I can't help but think that somewhere deep down, she's proud of that. Um, as for Archie and Yoshi, Archie was offered but declined a plea deal, ultimately serving 14 years for first degree burglary and false imprisonment. He served his time with few issues and was subsequently released on parole. As far as I could find, he's doing well. 
He's got a family, he's got a job, and hopefully he was able to put this whole kerfuffle far, far in his past. And Yoshi, on the other hand, pleaded guilty to his involvement and in return was only sentenced to four years in prison. And yeah, I think that actually about wraps us up for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. Did you ever hire any wayward teen boys to try and kill your siblings? Obviously I'm kidding, but God damn, was this story not banana nut muffin crazy? I have just so many conflicting emotions. I'm so glad that Sunny didn't end up dead, but it's also so sad that her life seems to have fallen so far apart after all of this. And then I'm happy that Gina got her shit together, was actually rehabilitated, and she went on to make something of herself. I don't know. Obviously, they were so incredibly toxic to one another, but it makes me sad that they were never able to work things out and have a healthy relationship. I love my sister so much, and I don't know what I would do without her, so... I don't know, I guess I just wish that everyone had that kind of bond with their siblings. Anyways, yeah, like I said, let me know what you think down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you have a case or topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form that I have linked in the description box. And while you're down there, you can also find all of the details and links for the products I use throughout today's video. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new videos every week. And if you turn on your post notifications, you'll be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys. Their parents mar- <laughs> Jesus. Honestly, I guessed- <laughs> What the fuck am I saying? Cuss- <laughs> It ain't gonna be turned in the- <laughs> Why? <laughs> His best friend, Jonathan- jo <laughs> Am I in focus? Hello? I better be. <laughs> am I in focus? <laughs> Maybe it's because I look like a fucking ghoul right now with no color to my face. Whatever. Cause this guy's trying to fucking piss me off. Inscaped. What the fuck am I saying? Try to